Today we're going to talk a little bit about the atonement, uh, specifically whether it's limited or particular. And we're going to look in large uh, at the book of 1 John, which is a book that has a lot of doctrine in it packed in a short book where John is reaffirming what was taught scripturally and he's contrasting it or inferring what is being taught contrary to sound doctrine and when we read the bible if we'll start to try and identify if we can the purpose of a book or the the big picture the central idea then we can kind of look inside at the details and see how that uh, relates to the big picture theme like in the book of john we know its purpose. God spoke through John and he actually wrote down the purpose of that book. In chapter 20 verses 30 and 31 say, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So John tells us the purpose of the book of John, the gospel of John. It's to get people saved. That in reading this book and believing on the truths in this book, they would believe in Christ, the Son of God. And through believing, they would have life through his name, redemption, what the Bible refers to as being saved or born again. And 1 John is full of statements saying, this was written, I wrote this, you know, because these things have I written. And John is laying out the reasons he wrote this epistle to believers. And numerous heresies are addressed in 1 John. One of the two biggest eye catchers are Antichrist, those that are Antichrist, and seducers. And today we're mainly going to focus in on the seducers because once someone becomes seduced by false doctrines and they leave the sound biblical doctrine as delivered by Christ and the apostles, if they refuse to come back to that or they go on to teach those same errors and those same heresies, they're no longer just being seduced. Now they're actually actively seducing others so that's the ones we're going to focus on primarily today the seduction of believers is a big topic of the book of first john and we see that in first john 2 26 these things have i written unto you concerning them that seduce you so it's not only that these believers were, people were attempting to sway them or lead them astray. They had successfully done so to them that seduce you. And John's trying to reestablish them back on the right path doctrinally and practically in their walk all throughout the book of, of First John. There's so many things that are addressed, whether or not Christ came in the flesh he says, yes, he did. Whether or not there's a heavenly unity of Father, Word, and Holy Ghost, he affirms that um, in all these different topics. But primarily we're going to look at one of those heresies that is clearly addressed in First John. So firstly, let's define biblically in what, it, you know, what does seduce mean? And it simply means to draw aside or entice from a path or rectitude and duty in any manner by flattery, promises, bribes, or otherwise to tempt and lead to iniquity, to the corrupt, or corrupt, to deprave. And an example in the dictionary was Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy 4. In the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed 
to seducing spirits. So these are believers. They're departing from the faith. And they're being led astray or seduced by the seducing spirits. Rectitude's not a, a word you hear a lot, and since it was in the definition, we'll define it quickly. And I'll put the dictionary definition up top. But simply put, it's that which is right and true, which for us is the Bible. It's the standard and what is set and measured by the Bible as right and true. So it's to draw aside or entice from the path of what's right and what the Bible shows is correct. That's what it means to be seduced. And though John gives many warnings in First John to reestablish sound doctrine, the seducers are a big focal point of where is this error coming from? And we see it's from these, these seducers. Believers were being led astray by false doctrine being brought forth by false prophets. So, you know, one way that we can tell if someone is a seducer or they have been seduced and they're going down this road of error is who they listen to. If they, if the Bible is their ultimate authority, if they're, if they go to the Bible and they side with scripture or if they go to other sources, what is their authority? And John here lays out a guideline for this particular book in first john addressing these specific heresies that in that in that debate those that listen to the apostles those that listen to what they received are the ones that are on the right side of the controversy and first john 4 6 says we are of god and the we here is your apostles he that knoweth god heareth us he that is not of god heareth not us hereby we know or hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error because john makes another statement at the beginning of the book laying this foundational topic and that's First John 1, uh, 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifest, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you, that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest unto us, that we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We see in the Bible that the apostles themselves walked, talked, and were trained by Jesus. They received the truth of salvation. They received the truth of practical living from Jesus. They handled him. They saw him with their eyes. They have the testimony that we can trust that Jesus chose them selectively to forward his message. We see even the Apostle Paul was chosen by Jesus on the road to Damascus as an apostle so if we can't trust them we have nothing to stand upon so those that listen to what the apostles say are the ones siding with truth those that will not listen to the apostles that will not listen to Christ that will not just conform to the scriptures are either seducers or they've been seduced by someone else. 
Within the body of First John, the atonement comes up, the propitiation for sin, who it is that it applies to, and that's the specific heresy I want to look at as John brings it up, because nowadays it's referred to as limited or particular atonement. And this isn't a light heresy because it's one of the ones brought up in this section of scripture is trying to get back the truth out of and get back in line, get believers back to this truth. So if we see something in this, this book, then that other error is being taught and John's correcting that heresy. And with the influx of Calvinist or particular atonement type seducers within the free grace community, this particular heresy, though John took time to address it and to put it among those that needed to be corrected, we're now seeing it downplayed as not that big a deal or, you know, something smaller than what it is. So first we'll go back to John's record as inspired by the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John. What was it that Jesus himself said pertaining to the atonement, who he would die for? Well, according to Jesus' own words, this was not a limited or particular atonement. John three fourteen through 17 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man, Jesus, be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So, according to these most famous passages, Jesus came into the world to save the world, not just a limited or select or elect few, that God so loved the world. That's the same world that he said, that he did not come to condemn, but that same world that he came to save. He came to die for every man, woman, and child, from Adam to the last man born, that his blood would be an atonement, a payment for their sin. We don't see a limited or particular atonement in the book of John. These limited and particular atonement teachers, you know, whether they're, they're believers that are seduced or seducers, they reject John 3.16, John 3.14, John 3.15. Because they profess that Christ only died for some. That for God so loved some. That he sent his only begotten son. And that's not what the text says. It says for God so loved the world. But they don't believe that. An easy way to pick up on whether this is their leaning. Is they often use the word elect. Because that's what they believe. That Jesus died for the elect, but not for the world. That what John recorded Christ saying isn't simply true the way it's written. They don't hear what the Bible says. They don't hear what the apostles say. They won't conform to what Scripture says. And we remember you have the Apostle John writing the Gospel of John. Then we have the Apostle John reaffirming basic truths from Scripture. 
and one of which is the basic understanding of John 3.16 is what he's addressing. And he does it in 1 John chapter 1, uh, 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So if the phrasing in, in the book of John, the world doesn't get the message across, we have here a, a more detailed description of who Christ died for, who, the, who is he the propitiation for, the whole world. Not a select or elect group only. And that same truth is told us in Hebrews 2 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Those that push limited in particular atonement do not believe this verse they do not profess this as truth they do not hear what the book of john says they do not hear what first john says they do not want to embrace the truth from the author of hebrews so when we're dealing with scripture the question might come up, well, what about the atonement? How does it how does it work? If he died for all, why are all not going to heaven? And I think if we go back and look further back in our Bibles in the Old Testament, we'll kind of get a better understanding. Because Jesus is referred to as our Passover in 1 Corinthians 5-7. The Bible says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So if we see Passover and we don't really have a maybe an understanding of how that works, we can go back by using the law of first mention, go back into the Old Testament and read some of the accounts that surrounds the Passover. How did it first come into play in Scripture? What are its elements and those things? And, and then with that understanding, look at the New Testament reference. And in Exodus 12, it says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to to your families and kill the Passover so we see that the lamb is taken and later we learn how that process plays out as far as the inspection making sure it's suitable and then we see the elements that takes place of this procedure so reading on down to the next few verses so after the lamb is killed, this Passover is killed, it says, And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over and will not suffer the destroyer to come in into your houses to smite you. So we see the blood, the lamb was killed for all. But it was seeing that blood, that sign of the blood, that seal, is what caused the passing over so that Israel was not smitten or killed 
along with the Egyptians, that their firstborn was not killed. So, was the Passover lamb slain for all of Israel? Were these lambs killed for all of Israel? Yes. The blood, the lamb was killed and the blood was shed for all and made it available to all. But did the killing of the lamb automatically profit every single person in Israel? And the answer is, answer is no. Had they not took the blood and put on the lintel in the doorpost, the blood would not be there and it would not prevent the slaying of their firstborn. For I will pass through the Exodus 12 again. It says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Now it's not, if you read that closely, it does not say only Egyptians. It says all the firstborn that are in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token, a sign, upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you, when I smite the land of Egypt. So if these Israelites refused to take that blood of, of the slain lamb, and had they chose to not put it where they were told, it would not benefit them. They had to trust and put their faith in that little act of putting it up there. You know, it was, a, it was showing their faith. And had they not done so, what is the implication from this passage? That the firstborn within any house that did not have that blood would be smitten. The blood had to be applied. The atonement in looking at Christ our Passover has been made for all he died for all he died for the world he tasted death for every man he's the propitiation for not only our sins those that have trusted him but for the sins of the whole world but that atonement you must receive this And we get that from passages such as 1 John 1, 12. But as many as received him. So that's an accepting. You're taking. You're accepting this gift. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. So you see that receiving there. It's offered. But you must receive. You must believe on the name of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is reaffirming the gospel basics, says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. You accepted. You took it as truth. You trusted this as truth. And wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So, let's break that down. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Paul says that firstly, if we go backwards, he received this. He accepted this the gospel then he goes on to preach that same message to the corinthians who also received what paul 
brought forth. And you see a clear gospel message brought Paul to salvation when he received it. And then he took that same message, that same seed, took it forth without changing it. It's the same thing he received. And it brought forth more fruit, other believers. But he ha he shows received. Romans 5 says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. You see this offering of a gift, offering of salvation to all, but a person has to receive this. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. What is the difference between a saved person and a lost person? The blood was shed for both. One receives it one doesn't. One accepts the gospel and trusts it. One doesn't. It's available to all men. That atonement must be received and applied just as the blood of the Passover lamb had to be applied. Though the lamb was slain, the blood had to be placed on the doorpost. Otherwise, it doesn't benefit the sinner. They refuse the gift. They refuse the atonement. How do we get access to this atonement, this grace that's offered to us? It's really simple. It's by faith. The same measure of faith all men have. They just need to change the object of their faith and receive what Christ did for them. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace. The faith has to be present before you can have access into the grace because your faith is the access point wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Your faith must shift from whatever it is a false god, a false religion, atheism, yourself, whatever it is, it must shift to putting your faith on Jesus Christ. And then we receive what the Bible speaks of is in regard to imputed righteousness. And to impute something is to charge it to, to attribute to, to set to the account of. Sometimes it's you know, bad things, you know, if you impute someone with a penalty for their crime, you have imputed their trespass against them, say with a prison sentence. And in salvations, uh, in regard to salvation, the imputation of, of the righteousness of Christ is imputed to a sinner by faith. But no faith toward Christ, no imputed righteousness. Romans 4, 3 and 4 speaks of, for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It was imputed to him. It was credited unto him for righteousness. His faith. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned or not imputed, not credited of grace, but of debt. It would be something owed to you. 
That's not how salvation works. For, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. We all have a sin debt that needs paying. And that's where the blood comes in. It paid your sins. It paid all of people's sins if they will receive it. Romans 4.22 says, And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. It was credited. It was applied to his account. And that's speaking of Abraham. And that's the way it works for all of us. We put our faith in Christ. That atonement, that righteousness is credited by faith. Not of our good merit, not of anything we've done. But it's our faith in accepting what Christ did for us. But because of their Gnostic philosophy that's been adopted, those of the limited or particular atonement persuasion, they can't grasp that. They can't grasp how salvation works. And many are saved believers that went on and got caught up in these Gnostic books or Calvinistic books and, and all these different things and have been seduced. But now they can't bring forth. They can't deliver to the next person what they originally received. They're trying to offer something different than what they trusted themselves in, leaving them to become unfruitful and leading another person to Christ. They're sharing a different message now. They can't or they refuse to understand that the free gift of life or the atonement that Christ made for all the world is offered to all but it only benefits those who will receive it. It is offered to all men. It benefits those that receive it. The free gift is available to all. And it must be received by each person by faith on an individual level. And when they put their faith in Christ, it's imputed or credited, bestowed upon that individual. Christ does it all. He did it all. All we can do is accept the payment, accept what he did for us. But the receiving or the rejection of salvation lands squarely on the shoulders of each individual. These other atonement type preachers, they don't hear the Bible. They don't hear Christ. They don't hear the apostles who all clearly show that Christ died for the sins of the world, not only for the saints, but is offered to all that will receive it. Those that deny an otherwise easy to see truth one that a child reading the book of John can come to understand. Or reading 1 John 2.2. 2, they're either purposely seducing others. Trying to lead others into their error. Or they're those that's been seduced by these philosophies and, and this Gnostic mindset. Which comes from a theolo any theological system based on the tulip. Any of them, no matter what label they, they put. They refuse to see this and they're either seducers or they've been seduced and now they're going on to try and, and it's tripping up others. How do we deal with people that are preaching a limited atonement or a particular atonement? And that's where... Properly defining this as a serious heresy comes into play because a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Knowing that he is, he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So this isn't limited to dealing with lost people. If a brother or a sister, whoever it is, if they're so deep into this heresy that they will not listen to the apostles, if they will not hear passages like 1 John 2.2 2, that are clear and plain and simple, they're not 
cloudy. They say what they say and you believe it or you don't. After the first and second admonition, give them a clear presentation of what these passages show. And if they will not change, the Bible says reject. Salvation that's available to all by grace, that it's available to all, is an essential aspect of the gospel. And that point of the gospel must be defended, even from wayward and seduced brethren. We don't want to be a partaker in spreading these, these heresies or these errors that can go on to seduce others and that deny aspects of the gospel like Christ died for the world or that he tastes the death for every man we don't want to be a partaker in this read 2 John 1 9-11 We're told to contend for the faith, like in Jude one three. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly, so sincerely, truthfully, contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. So we are to defend those components of the gospel. And if anyone denies that Christ died for all, denies a core and foundational truth, and they go on to say that his atonement was limited or particular only to some, some unknown and unnamed elect group, this is heresy. And those that spread such shouldn't be coddled or overlooked, they should be admonished and corrected. And if they refuse to repent, if they refuse to change their mind, refuse to change what they believe to come in line with the truth of, of doctrine such as this, we should mark and avoid so that it doesn't spread. That's the point of marking and avoiding. A big part of that is to, to isolate the spread of heresy but ultimately it's up to every saint to you to me to each one of us to decide what degree of heresy we're willing to overlook that we're willing to tolerate or work around and this isn't a matter of food or how we dress or practical matters you know, should we keep the Sabbath, should we not, those type things. This is a matter of aspects and components of the gospel. The most important thing we can do is share that message far and above anything else that we do. So I unapologetically side with the Bible and the word spoken by the Holy Spirit through, say, the Apostle John that Christ is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And I can in good conscience walk with anyone that will teach otherwise. So here's some food for thought and ponder how serious the implications of this is when you go around and or a person goes around and, and says, well, Christ may have died for you. I'm not sure. Because he didn't die for everybody. He died for some. We just don't know who that some is. And, and, and things like that. You don't get that from Scripture. You got that from somewhere else. So let's contend for the faith as it was delivered that salvation is open to all. It's available to all. And all a person has to do is simply trust and believe 
in Christ, the eternal Son of God who died, was buried and rose again to pay for their sins. All they have to do is receive it. It's offered to them. And they'll receive as a free gift everlasting life and be imputed with the righteousness of Christ. And I pray that if anyone's listening to this that never has trusted Christ, he died for your sins, for the sins of the whole world. He paid your sin debt. And he wants to apply that to you and give you everlasting life. All you have to do is trust him this day and he promises you will be saved and you will have life. So God bless you and take care. Till next time.